welcome. As you can see, we are commemorating the life of uh, Camille Sanson. He died in 1921 and is one of the people whose anniversaries we are able to commemorate. And today we are very privileged to have one of our members, Caroline von Nicker, doing a presentation on this remarkable musician's life. Uh, Caroline is Emeritus Professor of Music Education at the University of Pretoria. During her tenure of approximately 20 years there, she successfully supervised over 100 masters and doctoral studies. Now, dit moet gedoen word. She has been an elected board member of the International Society for Music Education and subsequently first president of the Pan-African Society for Music Education. She continues with both academic and volunteer community work. Thank you, Caroline, for your services to music and to U3A, and we look forward to hearing your presentation this morning. Thank you, Letitia. This is one picture of the gent that we are speaking about today, the Parisian Saint-Saëns, and for a more accurate pronunciation of his name than I, with my severely limited French, can give, especially as he actually has two double-barreled and hyphenated names, you can listen here. Charles Camille Saint-Saëns. Charles Camille Saint-Saëns. Charles Camille Saint-Saëns. Fortunately, the internet provides us these days with such pronunciation guides, although Sassans is basically known only as Camille Sassans, or simply by his surname, Sassans. And as we learn best about music from participating in it, whether as listeners or even better active music makers, we learn more from listening to an example than being given the information that French musicians and intellectuals often still use the traditional pronunciation without S at the end, but the pronunciation with S is now very common in French, even among radio announcers. Charles Camille Saint-Saëns. Charles Camille Saint-Saëns. Saint-Saëns himself apparently wanted his name to be pronounced like that of the town Saint-Saëns, which was pronounced without S at the end until about 1940, 1950, in accordance with the spelling without S that was in use until about 1840 to 1860, as explained in the history of the town. The diuresis on the E dates from a time when the E was not silent, but the diuresis no longer affects the pronunciation of the name. This year is the anniversary of Saint-Saëns' death, in 1921 in Algiers, where it was his custom over many years to winter. But on the 16th of December, 1921, he died without warning of a heart attack. The recognition he enjoyed was no doubt exemplified by the fact that his body was taken back to Paris where he was given a state funeral. And it's also some indication of why we take the trouble to remember the centenary of his death. We typically use such anniversaries and occasions of special remembrance as hooks on which to hang programs dedicated to thoughts about and memories of significant individuals. This past January, for example, was the famous Spanish tenor Placido Domingo's 80th birthday. Seen here, in both his younger and more recent days. However, we have nothing in 2021 as significant as was 2020's big Beethoven year, although it is interesting that Sassans has been dubbed the French Beethoven. But should you be interested in checking on such special events, here is a good website of commemorations. This is a shot of the cover of My Bluffer's Guide to Music. My beloved copy dates back to 1971, and you might have guessed such a date from the price indication of one US dollar up on the right-hand corner of the cover. 
It also has a foreword by the inimitable Sir David Frost, who among other things was of course specifically known as a satirist. And you'll see a picture of him in younger days, as some of you may remember him. The reason I like Bluffer's Guides is comparable to why I so enjoy Anina Lee's Village News articles and her recent presentation to us. You really have to know your stuff to make it sound simple and such that while being scientifically accurate, I find I can read from Anina's articles to a small grandson who listens rapidly to every word. I have a collection of Bluffer's Guides on every conceivable topic built up over many years and kept stored alphabetically from accounting to women. And then there are the xenophobes guides. Why I find them all such fun and so good is that you need to be on top of your subject to be truly witty about it. And so even though I am supposed to know something about music, I love the book on the topic of bluffing your way in music. I learn from it and I have even taught students using it because it can grab their attention. My main interest in the field of music is music education and I will explain something during this presentation of the influence this has on how one approaches musical material and its use because we have to compete with modern media and that means we are in the business of edutainment and not just music education. In the Bluffer's Guide to Music specifically, there is no mention of Sassons, who is definitely not one of music's big five. Although Bluffer's notes only four composers beyond criticism, and those are Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and your own particular favorite. Assign which composer you like to these pictures and think why you might do so. That is a typical kind of music education activity. For some brief info on Sassons, here is a caricature of him as a boy. He doesn't seem very boyish by today's standards, but then neither does the fact that before he was three years old, he reputedly displayed perfect pitch and enjoyed picking out tunes on the piano. When he was seven, he became a pupil of the then quite famous teacher Stamati. Well aware of her son's precocious talent, his mother did not wish him to become famous too young. And we need to see this statement in context. The music critic, Harold Schoenberg, who himself became the first music critic to win the Pulitzer Prize for criticism, wrote of Sassons, it is not generally realized that he was the most remarkable child prodigy in history, and that includes Mozart. Sassons gave occasional performances for small audiences from the age of five, when he accompanied a Beethoven violin sonata on the piano. But it was not until he was 10 that he made his official public debut in a program that included both a Mozart and a Beethoven piano concerto. Through his piano teacher Stamati's influence, Sassans was introduced to a well-known composition professor and a well-known organ teacher from whom he acquired a lifelong love of Bach's music, which at that stage was little known in France. As an aside in the music world, France is seen in many ways separately from other parts of Europe. And this is also the case with English music and composers. Though Sassans was a great traveler, and in fact, from the 1870s until the end of his life, made 179 trips to 27 countries. He visited not only England, plus Bach's German homeland, but ventured as far as America. He was especially proud of the acknowledgement he received in England, including honorary doctorates from first Cambridge and later Oxford. Sassars developed early as an all-round musician, pianist, composer, organist, 
writing his first full symphony at the age of 16. But as a schoolboy, he was also outstanding in French literature, Latin and Greek, divinity and mathematics, and his interests included philosophy, archaeology, and astronomy. He remained a talented amateur astronomer in later life. Saint-Saëns is viewed by some as one of the greatest composers that France has produced notable for his pioneering efforts on behalf of French music. This is despite other well-known French composers, and here is a list of some authorities, top six such composers, who, and I quote, will be remembered by history as the most celebrated composers the world have ever seen. And here they are. Debussy, Berlioz, Eric Satie, and one often gets his first name used together with the Satie as he isn't quite so well known just as Satie, Messiaen, Ravel, and Gabriel Fora who was actually a student of Sassan's. I have kept them in the order in which they were listed, so it's not necessarily my particular choice or yours. Back to Sassan's and a different picture of him, who apart from his musical activities was also a writer of criticism, poetry, essays and plays. Needless to say, it is difficult to measure the level of performers on whatever instruments or as conductors from pre our modern era of audio and video recordings. So although Sassas was a pioneer in recorded music and the Gramophone Company of London sent a producer to Paris in 1904 to record him as both an accompanist and as a soloist in his own piano music, he is best known today as a composer and really a romantic era composer. Now, this is the sort of information important to those studying music history. The romantic period specifically in music where dates are not necessarily the same as those typically given for art or literature started around 1830 and ended around 1900 as compositions became increasingly expressive and inventive. During this period, expansive symphonies, virtuosic piano music, dramatic operas, and passionate songs took inspiration from art and literature. And you can guess that romanticism in art and literature often predated the movement in music if music was influenced and inspired by those two art forms. To me as a music educator, the question is whether pupils and students, and even U3A members, will absorb this factual information, and how best. I hope I have not descended to the level of the kind of gossip much beloved by some teaching so-called music history and writing musicians' biographies, but focusing on aspects in the case of Sassons, such as his unsuccessful marriage at nearly 40 to a 19-year-old, the death of his two children in infancy, questions raised as to his sexuality, etc. But what has been wrong with this presentation so far from a music education point of view? I've at least shown you visuals, which helps gain and hold attention, but there has been no music. And talking about music does not constitute music education. We need some so-called ear treats. So let's turn our attention to some of Sassan's special gems, skipping over his life since boyhood. As you can see, he is here, quite a, an older man. As a prolific composer, Sassans is reputedly chiefly remembered for his symphonic poems, the first of that genre to be written by a Frenchman. The third of these four 
is the well-known dance macaque. It started out in 1872 as an art song for voice and piano with a French text by the poet Henri Cazalis. Frequently composers do recycle their musical ideas in different forms. And we will speak later of another example of Sassons doing this. Dance Macabre as a theme was meant to represent how death was the great social equalizer. No one escapes the dance with death. And there were a number of paintings and pieces of art inspired by this philosophy, an indication of the symbiotic relationship between different art forms to which I will also refer a little later. We will now hear a depiction of skeletons dancing at midnight. Sassan's generally achieved his orchestral effects by deft harmonization rather than exotic instrumentation. But in this piece, he featured the xylophone prominently, representing the rattling bones of the dancers. There are many recordings available of this work, but I chose this one for music educational reasons, because it is of a female conductor and of young people playing in a Polish music schools competition, as you can see on the screen. I also thought that you would enjoy seeing their exuberance and great talent. Another of Sasson's signature works is his opera Samson and Delilah, that's the English pronunciation, or a French composer of the 19th century. Opera was seen as the most important type of music. What you will now hear is a popular mezzo-soprano aria from this opera, known in English as Softly Awakes My Heart, or more literally, My Heart Opens Itself to Your Voice. It is sung by Delilah as she attempts to seduce Samson into revealing the secret of his strength. And one of the reasons I chose this particular singer's performance is for her looks. You can find many versions sung by some decidedly unseductive and ungainly ladies who also contort their faces while singing.
I hope you enjoyed Elisa Kolosova singing that as much as I do. But be forewarned about trying it on a class of typical teenagers and especially boys. Somehow, sopranos typically send them into paroxysms of mirth. Realize, please, too, how long the aria was. Six and a half minutes. And I left it uncut. Because there is great pleasure to be had from listening to a full work rather than bite-sized chunks. Music education research tells us this, the value of listening to full works, but also shows us that young people's concentration spans can be as short as 30 seconds. And often it is as though they are pre-programmed according to the length of typical television adverts these days. People of all ages often come to know classical music from its use for advertisement purposes. I would like to show you some footage from a lecture on music in the context of advertising. This is one of the wonderful free lectures available regularly from Gresham College in London. In this presentation, Dr. Stephen Rose does not talk about the use of cheesy words, as he describes it, set to some well-known tune in order to stimulate purchasing, but he concentrates on Ravel and Saint-Saëns, who, who both wrote music for commissions and for different advertising purposes. By way of introduction, I wanted to ask, why do composers write music? Is it because of inspiration welling up from inside them or because of external factors like the commission of patrons? How to balance the internal and the external to balance inspiration versus commission is an age old dilemma for composers. Today, we will look at two examples of music that were written for apparently the most external of reasons for advertising to sell something. The first piece is Maurice Ravel's Introduction and Allegro, written on the commission of the Erard firm of piano and harp builders to showcase the abilities of an Erard pedal harp. The second piece is Saint-Saëns' Fantasy for Violin and Harp, written to publicise the skills of a musical duo of two sisters. And now we will hear an excerpt of the music that Saint-Saëns wrote for this purpose. One of Sassan's most well-known and valuable educational works 
along the lines of Prokofiev's beloved Peter and the Wolf is the carnival of the animals. Conceived with his students in mind, but only completed more than 20 years after he left teaching at the School for Classical Music and Religion in Paris. I'm not going to attempt the pronunciation of that lengthy title in French. It was the only teaching post he held in his life and he remained there for less than five years. Nevertheless, he is seen as a music educator of note as even evidenced by his pupils' admiration of their relationship with him. By some, the carnival is regarded as his most famous work and Grove's Dictionary of Music and Musicians rates it as, and I quote, his most brilliant comic work, parodying Offenbach, Berlioz, Mendelssohn, Rossini, his own dance macabre and several popular tunes. Close quote. Interestingly, he forbade performances of it during his lifetime, concerned that its frivolity would damage his reputation as a serious composer. celebration of all the animal creation, a carnival, a jamboree, a musical menagerie. And though he poked a lot of fun, twas all affectionately done. He plundered with a wicked thrill Rossini's Barber of Seville, and other tunes he freely chose from Offenbach, Berlioz, although it's only fair to tell he did steal from himself as well. Now it is time we took our places and showed our philharmonic graces in praise of feather, fur and fin. Let's hope the maestro is listening in. The lion is the king of beasts. His crown a golden mane. He has an air of dignity and yellow-eyed disdain. His paws which look so velvety, aren't only there for show. So if he asks you round for tea, it's wiser not to go.
I hope you enjoyed Roger Moore, not as James Bond this time, as well as the second of the 14 movements of Carnival of the Animals. The movement about the lion is the second movement. But here is something different. In the late 1940s, Goddard Lieberman of Columbia Records and conductor Andre Costellanis had the inspired idea of adding poetry to Saint-Saëns' score. The American Ogden Nash was their first and only choice as poet, as was Noel Coward as speaker for the projected recording. The result of this collaboration was released in 1950 with Costellanitz conducting the New York Philharmonic. Camille Saint-Saëns was wrecked with pains when people addressed him as Saint Saëns. He held the human race to blame because it could not pronounce his name. So he turned with metronome and fife to glorify other forms of life. Be quiet, please, for here begins his salute to feathers, furs, and fins. The lion is the king of beasts. The lion is the king of beasts and husband of the lioness. Gazelles and things on which he feasts address him as your highness. There are those who admire that roar of his in the African jungles and felts, but I think Wherever a lion is, I'd rather be somewhere else. That was only the introduction and the second lion movement again. But on this slide, you see the list of the remaining 12 movements, including the sublime swan with which we will end. Although the Nash words for the finale are also great fun. Now we reach the grand finale, animale, carnivale, noises new to sea and land, issue from the skillful band. All the strings contort their features, imitating crawly creatures. All the brasses look like mumps from blowing oompa oompa umps. In outdoing Barnum and Bailey and Ringling, Sassans has done a miraculous thingling. And now we will listen to Yo-Yo Ma playing the swan and I, don't think there could be anything better than this rendition, although he chooses to play it considerably slower than many other recordings.
that beautiful short piece was the only one out of all the 14 movements of the carnival that Sassan was allowed to be performed during his life. Here is a picture of him at his farewell concert as a pianist in Paris in 1913. Well, it was intended to be his farewell concert, but his retirement was soon in abeyance as a result of the war, during which he gave many performances in France and elsewhere, raising money for war charities. These activities took him across the Atlantic, despite the danger from German submarines. And that is an interesting insight into what could be described as bravery on the part of Sassars. He was also um, in the wars previously, so he did uh, see active service. But in November 1921, he gave a recital for a large invited audience. It was remarked that his playing was as vivid and precise as ever, and that his personal bearing was admirable for a man of 86. He left Paris a month later for Algiers, where he died. In 2004, the British cellist Stephen Isselis said, Sassars is exactly the sort of composer who needs a festival to himself. I've played all his cello music and there isn't one bad piece. His works are rewarding in every way and he's an endlessly fascinating figure. Thank you to all of you who have joined this morning and I hope that you've enjoyed that. Thank you, Caroline. That was lovely, thank you. I happen to have a, a similar copy on my shelf called The Bluffer's Guide to Literature, and it's great fun. Yes, I've got that one as well. Caroline, I have a question. If he was such a child prodigy, he certainly was not as prolific and a composer as Mozart was. No, although he, he was prolific, and of course he wasn't prolific only as a composer. Um, at one stage, he was very active as a performer, both as a pianist and as an, and an organist. And the church where he was initially the organist before he went to the uh, very famous Madeleine uh, Cathedral was a church that had as many, it is said, as 26,000 members. And so it was a very lucrative position for him because uh, just all the weddings and funerals that he played for brought in a lot of money. So he wasn't just a pianist and an organist and for the brief while, as we said, uh, a music educator, but he was also writing all his other things, poetry, criticism. He wrote some of the librettos uh, for his own operas. So I think he was prolific, but Mozart's huge output was really because he was only composing music, but Sassons was composing music and doing a whole lot else besides. I think that's probably the explanation. This is David. I was just wondering, I, I, had, I missed parts of your presentation, unfortunately, because of interruptions. Um, we have both of Sansan's piano concertos on CD. Um, did you discuss them at all? No, I didn't because um, uh, there were several things that I, I could have included, the, the Rondo Capriccioso, but what is difficult is um, when you can't play uh, whole movements, whole works, because they're too long, and yet it doesn't seem right to chop it up into little bits. So that was one of the reasons I didn't, um, I didn't play any of those, or, or for example, the Rondo Capriccioso. But it is generally uh, accepted that Carnival of the Animals is possibly his, his best known work and, and the most loved of all the movements is the, uh, the swan. But if you explore a little bit, it's very interesting to discover how much faster most cellists play the swan 
than uh, Yo-Yo Ma uh, chose to do. So I found that uh, interesting listening to different examples. And of course, I think everybody always likes uh, listening to a Yo-Yo Ma recording. Thank you. That all makes perfect sense. I love the uh, Samson and Delilah aria as well. Yes, it's a lovely work. And, and a, a way into the aria, you'll probably realize that there's a section that you know a lot better than um, the beginning part. But luckily, six and a half minutes, you can still fit into a presentation. But um, other works are even just one movement of another work just becomes too long, I think, for people to concentrate on. Caroline, I have heard the Carnival of the Animals played in many other settings. Obviously in movies, in advertising, it's often used for many other purposes. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, it is. I think that each movement is so characteristic and it stimulates people's imagination. And that is why it is also used a lot in music education um, in the same way as Peter and the Wolf is used. Well, all right, Peter and the Wolf is mostly to introduce children to the timbre of different uh, musical instruments. But um, the Carnival of the Animals, uh, I could show you, for example, there's a whole a huge free resource for teachers these days with all kinds of lesson plans and listening guides. And um, it's, it's wonderful that teachers these days have these resources because the old days, if, if I think back to when I studied music at Stellenbosch, how we would have lecturers who would do things like put on a whole uh, symphony for us to listen to in, um, music history on a Friday afternoon and we would all put our heads down on the desks and we would be just supposed to listen for whatever length of time, 20 minutes, 25, 30 minutes. Needless to say, we were certainly not listening to the music and that just doesn't work, especially these days when even with reading um, books, we want to see things like text boxes and different fonts and colors and we've become accustomed to that sort of stimulation. But for a teacher to do it all by themselves um, is, is a huge job. And the last while with COVID, um, all these free educational packages that are available have been an absolute boon to teachers. My favorite bit from the carnival, of course, is the elephant. Love it. Well, many people will say as adults, I find, that um, they, they still love the uh, carnival and particular movements like you've suggested. And they say that be often then um, indicating that they came to know it as children. And because they got to know it well when they were young, it has continued to be a favorite throughout their lives. And, and we know that the, the question of um, what is well known to you is also often well loved. And many people speak about how they learned uh, about the carnival of the animals when they were at school. And if they were in schools where there was good class music instruction, as they used to be in schools in the past. And sadly, um, a lot of that has, has gone down the drain over the years, partly because there is now integrated arts um, at school. So one teacher is supposed to be teaching class music, as we used to call it, and dance and drama and visual art. And there are certainly very few people that I know capable of dealing with all those art forms. So then what many of them do is simply to concentrate much more on one art form which they can cope with and if they haven't got musical background that's often not music as one of those four art forms and then the children are just the ones that uh, miss out and that's that's very sad because they don't have that basis which then gives them the foundation for their interest in music for the rest of their lives. Opens a lovely space for grannies and aunties. 
Yes, I only absolutely. got to know uh, the, the carnival as an adult. And um, uh, my nieces and nephews were all subjected to and I hope entranced by it. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to share with young people. Well, I think one of the um, attributes that I most uh, appreciate is the fact that to my grandchildren, I am known as their music Omar. And that pleases me greatly because at least I can do something about their uh, music education. And even with the little ones in this um, time of the pandemic where people have had wonderful music programs for preschool children, they haven't been able to present them. And so children who might have gone to such a program from the age of two onwards, they've already missed a whole year and more of uh, music classes and uh, where parents have been so busy uh, trying to work from home and cope with all sorts of things they typically don't then uh, sing with their children as one would hope that they do because there's also a fairly common perception that uh, if you don't have a good voice you shouldn't uh, sing with your children or sing to them because some parents will even say, oh, I'll make my child, um, uh, I'll put my child off music. I'll teach them how to sing out of tune. But the research shows us that that is not the case, that it is the bond between uh, adult and child strengthened by singing together that actually makes such a difference. And I'm only now talking about singing. Of course, there are many other musical activities that you can also do with children, playing music to them, recordings, um, doing uh, rhythmical activities, um, all kinds of things. So it's a great pity when that doesn't happen because the children uh, are the losers. You mentioned that he had a state funeral, so he must have been quite well known and popular. But was his music as popular during his lifetime as some of the other composers? And were they well attended? Um, Yes, they were well attended and um, I mean, for example, he enjoyed great popularity in uh, Britain and he particularly liked going to England and uh, having performances there and performances where there were vocal aspects, choral aspects, because he said that uh, the British were the um, world leaders in terms of choir singing and um, he he didn't just have a state funeral I mean I could have listed a whole lot of other honors as well but for example it was it is noted by many authorities on him it was surprising that there were quite a number of statues dedicated to him uh, during his lifetime whereas they said that typically you know people only have statues of themselves erected after their deaths. There's quite a lot of uh, controversy also around whether he was a supportive of more modern French composers and, and composers from other countries, but the more modern composers like, say, Debussy. But to what extent was he against uh, Debussy? And in some of his activities at the Institute, he, um, you know, expressed some quite strong opinions against other younger composers. But then there were also the composers like Gabriel Faure, who was a student of his and who was very admiring of everything that uh, Saint-Saëns taught them. And some people are of the opinion that he was more appreciative of the structure of the older composers. And what he didn't like about the younger and more modern composers was when he felt that their works didn't have the structure and the form of the uh, older composers. But there is quite a lot of controversy as to exactly uh, who did he support, who didn't he support, uh, what was he in favor of, what was he not in favor of. But certainly those students who studied with him um, were all very admiring and wrote about how he taught them such a great deal. 
thank you to, to Caroline. It was a lovely presentation. And with the variety of his works that, that we, we know so well. And it was just fun to have it presented to us like this. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.